So, uh, JD, you all set, man? All set. Let's go. Okay. Um, I want to make sure that everyone has got uh, their worksheet. And it, we've, we've had a couple of glitches um, in terms of emails not getting automatically si uh, s sent out when, when you initially signed up. And, and so in that, in that automated email was um, a link that would have taken you to, um, to grab the PDF, which is a worksheet. Uh, so I'm encouraging that, that if you don't have it printed out, that's fine. But be sure you got paper and either pen and pencil, because this is going to be a working exercise that Joel and I are going to kind of work each other through. But you guys will be getting ideas of what of those areas of your game that you kind of want to that you kind of want to focus on. Sandra, thank you for 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 joining us as well as uh, Thayer too. So uh, again, I just a quick reminder on the chat box, and I know that guys that that some of you um, are are new here, right? Because I know JD that you I think you put some I think you put the link out to sign up over at Twitter. So we probably got a few folks in here that uh, that don't know who I am. Uh, I am Brent Abel. I am your host, and just a little bullet points below my picture there on the left. Uh, currently, ten national USA titles in singles and doubles. I got to admit, half of those are with my beautiful wife, Mai, in the husband wife. Uh, a grass, a hard, and three clays. But I got two, I got two uh, singles titles and a couple of men's titles uh, as well. Uh, captain last year and also this year of the USA World Cup 70s team, which is played, this year's played in uh, Umag, Croatia, again, as it was last year, but it's coming up in September. 45-year coaching career. Actually, it's longer than that, but I feel like I'm going to super date myself if I go over 50 on the coaching career. Founder of webtennis.com back in 1999. JD, it's been 20 years, man. That's a good effort. It's, wow. it's crazy. Um, and then creator of What's the Right Shot and co-creator with Jeff uh, Jacklich of goldballhunting.com. That guy on the right, Joel Drucker, historian at large, International Tennis Hall of Fame, and author of two great books, Jimmy Connor Saved My Life and Don't Bet on It. And yes, we actually added this little extra bullet point during our, our test webinar this morning. A very nasty 4.5 lefty. And it's, it's a little bit, you, it's kind of like, what's that sign, you know, um, take it risk or something like this. You're, you're taking on the risk all of your own when you go out there in the court with Drucker because he's been known to slice and dice and hack his way to causing injuries for other opponents out there. I can hit tops and backhands. Just don't, let's not forget that. Okay. That's true. Well, it's pretty. It's pretty. It's two rotations. It's two rotations. That's right. That's right. And we're not talking like uh, Stan Rowinka here. Yeah. Well, then of course Robin is going. Is there anything but nasty lefties? Nah, Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Probably not. Thank you. Um, and so Brian's got a great question. Over seventy, playing twenty plus year olds in competition. Best tactics. You know what? We're going to work on that. That's a great question, Brian. We'll get to that. So here's what we're going to do is, again, I want to help you guys pinpoint that one thing you game that's holding you back from getting the results that you want in your game, again, whether it's singles and or doubles. And I, at the end of uh, the, the webinar today, I'm going to give you some ideas of how you can fix what is your one thing. And the way we're going to do this is Joel and I are going to ask each other, and I've got my chat box in front of the thing, so here we go. Joel and I are going to ask each other, um, to answer each of the four questions that you've got on your worksheet that apply to both uh, him and myself. And then this will help give you some ideas in those specific areas of your game where you feel that you need to get better. And so as Joel and I go through each one of the questions, I want you to use your worksheet to create your own unique list of specific things to work on that apply to your game. So JD, are we ready? Let's Here we go. go. Question number one, uh, Mr. Drucker, which strokes in your game are inconsistent or, or frustrate you? Don't tell anyone, and this is going out public, but high balls down the middle to my forehand are not fun. Which high balls eat? down the middle? To the forehand. To the forehand. Okay. And my yeah. grip is semi-eastern. I'm not continental, but it's, uh, those are tough. Those okay. are tough technique-wise. High okay. balls. Particularly down the middle. I, I would say for most players, that's probably, that's probably true. Um, but you what want I, a second? A second? Yes. Um, I, I, you know, come on, man. I'm, we'll cut third. I, we'll I, be know I know you're a hell of a player. Stop that. Okay, All right. Um, right. Softballs. Softballs to my forehand volley. Okay. I think that, that's, the, that's a so, 
Yeah. And so there's, in your mind, there is, there is some technique that you could work on to improve upon that. Yeah. And when I think of these shots, when you asked the question, uh, Brent, just before, wow, a third one. Wow. Look at this is, um, is, uh, I asked myself, I thought, what's a shot we, what's a shot I well, I don't want to have to hit on a big point. You know, it's like, that's almost like the litmus test. It's like, okay, I hope I don't have to deal well, with that's, one. Well, that's, well, that's a really good question. So is this a shot I would really not hit, want to hit on a, on a, on a big so, point. So what, so what ball can I give you on a huge point that you just don't want to see? Oh, these two, these two, the first one in particular, if, if I, if I'm on the baseline and you hit a high slow ball down the middle to my forehand and it's a big point, it's like, oh, okay. All right. And, the, and you know, if you had those, those little skin response things, um, measures like this would be the more beep, beep, beep. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. All right. So, so for what, you, what just you? well, uh, my first thing, as Jeff Jacklich um, knows quite well, is uh, my standard forehand rally ball. I am working on, on trying to keep the left shoulder closed more because I tend to open up. The shoulders fly open, and then I get a natural <laughs> windshield wiper forehand, which I don't want. So and what, happen, where, and what happens to the forehand? Does it does it miss or does it go short? Yeah, go I mean, it either it 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 can it can end up short. It can end up uh, um, to where it actually sails sometimes because it really, since it's going kind of side to side, it gets this kind of side spin and it just takes off. It just sails. Mm -hmm. It just sails. Um, another one for me, as we talked about earlier today, is my overhead. And you know, for me, the overhead is. I mean, I'm consistent with it, but I don't, I don't give it enough, especially on, on, on lobs that are, you know, right around the service line for me where I've got to back up in, in, in singles or doubles. And I just feel like my mindset is too much. You know what? Let's just play this as an approach shot. Let's make sure that we maintain the good core position. And on some lobs, for sure, I got to do that. I, you know, I mean, the ball's behind me and I can't really make, I, you know, I couldn't be offensive anyway. But I think if I, if you were to ask me, well, how do you want to lose the point if you get, if you're going to hit an overhead, you know, right now I'd rather lose the point because I ding one or two deep rather than making sure that I get it in, reclaim the net position and somehow lose the point in singers and doubles. That so you way. feel you're going to play a little less aggressively than you might. Yeah, yeah. So I, so for me, the technique would be I got to get my feet back behind the ball quicker. I can't drift so much. I got to get back there. Got to work the feet harder. Get back. Worst case, I get too far back, and now I got to scoot back up a step or two. But that's good because then you're getting some forward momentum with the body weight, and you can be more aggressive. I think with the swing. Um, I want to. I see this question here about the semi-eastern forehand. Um, this is this is kind of a joke I make because even though I learned an Eastern grip as a net rusher, I probably migrate a little more continental and don't get as much. You know, I I've, don't really know much from a Western grip. So the problem on those high balls is I I don't have as much leverage technique working for me. So I'm kind of flail at, at it a little bit more. So that's that's the semi-Eastern to answer the question. Well, I I, th I think technically the semi-Eastern is a is a hybrid grip between a full Eastern forehand and a continental. Right. And you know, you've played enough to see what you, we, we see that a lot where we play. Yeah. And so, anyway. I mean, look, I think that we all, we all sort of can find a, a full Eastern. We can all find the continental, but you know, what do we really use in our strokes? Well, I knew, I, I know that I use, uh, you know, a, a, a full Eastern on some forehands. I know I use a continental on some forehands and there's probably a whole bunch of other balls in between that I present on my forehand side that I go with sort of a semi-Eastern kind of hybridized forehand grip. So, um, I mean, trying to teach that, trying to say, hey, well, you got to be minutely right here on the handle, I think is, is personal. You got to figure that one out for yourself if it really does work. And this is kind of the thing that Jeff and I rail about a lot at, over at Gold Ball Hunting is that coaches and teachers out there are trying to tell you there is one way to do it and one way only. And your hand might be built a little different than mine, Joel, might be built a little mm -hmm. diff different than Jeff's. And it just, it just lays on the handle better. Maybe in my case, a continental, maybe your case, an Eastern forehand, maybe in, in major Dan's it's um, you know, it's more of this semi Eastern. So I can't really tell you. I've um, seen pros. I've seen pros who have grips 
they, they have a certain grips. There's a, a pro I work with a very, in, in television, this person's very accomplished player, was a content grip player, had the grip a writ customized so you couldn't find an Eastern grip on that record. Oh, grip, so, the so, so, so how, however you, however you place your handle on, I mean, your, your, your hand on the, on the well, handle. Well, it was that person's racket. So yeah, it was yeah. built right. for yeah. them. And that's, you know, and they knew their, they knew their grip really well and they found it. It's interesting, uh, interesting thing. Yeah. Um, I've got one more thing here on technique and that is on my serve. I want to continue to toss further out in front further. On both, on first and second, yep. even your yep. kick? Yep. Okay. Yeah, well, and I don't have a kick. Let's be honest. I don't have a kick. Mm -hmm. I've, got a, I've, got a, I've got a high bouncer, but do I have a, do I have a big time? No, you have a high bouncer. Yeah, I, I got, I, right. And, and my high bouncer gets better when I keep my toss in front. Everyone mm -hmm. goes, well, that's crazy. I thought, I thought you had to toss behind your head and all that kind of stuff and behind your back to get the ball to spin up. Well, no, you can, you can toss. You can keep the toss out in front where for me, first or second, I do generate more racket speed. Maybe a younger guy can put the ball behind his back and, and still generate that kind of racket speed. I can't. So I put it out in front. And yet if I stay sideways long enough with that toss in front, it's like the ball's behind me, right? It's like... I mean, I've got my body aligned so that the racket addresses the ball the way I want, which is which is getting the kind of spin I want. But I get too I, I get a little I get a little lazy sometimes, and I just keep that that toss a little bit too far on top of me. So I don't get as much racket speed. I don't get the same quality spin. I don't get the same quality high bounce out of the service box, and I don't naturally get in if I'm playing serve and volley. I I naturally don't get in as well with that toss out. Right. So. Anything else in yours, or you're just you're just a two? Uh, I'm a two shot man. Two I mean, shot actually, man. when I think when I think of my uh, my uh, my technical breakdowns in tennis, this is um, this is a good eighty to ninety percent of the pain. Okay, I would say I All would right. say when I think of when I think of when I look at at at, at matches and situations, it's like oh yeah, and and you know things that's like okay, and then you know it's it's not and it's not necessarily always missing them as much as sometimes not doing as much of them as I wish I had, like on the high ball down the middle. It's like, well, okay, I made it, but boy, it went like, you know, two inches past the service line yeah. or, or the forehand volley, which um, uh, that didn't really bite through the court the way I know I do on my backhand volley or the way I would on another one. It's like, and I've asked, I've asked pros, I asked a pro who won the, um, another a Wimbledon champion. I said, did you ever intentionally serve to the guy's strength because you knew you'd get a harder ball than serve to his weakness, where you knew you'd get a softer ball. He said, "Yeah, absolutely." He would sometimes serve. So, yeah. so good. I don't want this guy to hit a soft return because now I'll wobble. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. want this guy to hit a, a fairly flat return. Not, I, I know his pace; it's not too big. I'll field it that way. It's yeah. not funny. It's and that's like, more. And that's more tactical than right. Than, uh, technique. But, so but listen, guys. I, I want to make sure here that that you're listing as many things as you possibly can think of in, in terms of stroke technique. I mean, so don't just, I mean, you don't have to go with the two, with the two thing with Joe or the three with me. I mean, look, start thinking about your, 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 your standard forehand and backhand rally balls, you know, start thinking about the top spin, the side, you know, the, the underspin first serve, second serve, your volleys, your return to serve, you know, whatever it is, but think about technique. And if you're, if, if you go ahead and list, a bunch of them, that's even better, right? Because I'm going to show you when we come back if, in terms of because. All right, J.D., let's, let's, let's move on here. So, Joel, which tactics or strategies in your game just don't work as well as you want? I'll start with something that works to get to the thing that doesn't work. I, I win most of my matches get, getting my way to the net eventually, whether I'm going to serve in volley or whether I'm going to opportunistically get my way or whatever. And the, hard, the thing that's always been hard for me is the thing, okay, I'm going to try to win points here. I'm not going to worry about coming to net. I'm going to grind. I'm going to hunker down. And I'm going to make four, six, eight, ten balls. And I'm not going to look for a short ball. I'm not going to suddenly hit a moon ball approach and come running in. I think that's the hardest thing. So I would say like the, the grinder, yeah, learn to grind. Yeah, yeah. So for me, that was, that was a big deal. I mean, when I turned 60 and I made the team my – I guess my second year, 
I made the, I made the team. We went to Perth, Australia, and I was pure serving volley then. I mean, I had no, as I do now, I had no ability to stay back. It was, it was kind of weird. And so I go to Perth and we play the team event. And then I stayed the following week and, uh, and played the individual world thing there in Perth. And we're playing on the artificial grass. And I had a couple of really good wins. And now I'm in the quarters, I think it was. I think it was the quarters. And I'm playing a guy who's good from Australia. And it rained that morning. And, and they sent us out still. And <laughs> they sent us out. And, you know, this, this, this stuff is this artificial grass. Is, it's almost plastic, right? And even though it's got some sand on it. So I serve in the first – I think it's the first point of the match. I serve and come in and I split step and I'm like, uh, as Sharapova says, I'm like a cow on ice. Yeah, My nice. legs splay out and I'm going, if I just ripped everything inside both legs, you know, I check, I get up, I'm okay. But I realize I'm screwed. I am screwed. I cannot with these core conditions, I can't serve and volley. I can't chip and charge behind a second serve and be able to come in and play a volley. And so, and I realized because I don't really have a backcourt game. I didn't, I didn't do what you just suggested, which, which is to learn to grind. So over the years, the past several years, I have spent a ton of time on the practice court staying back. In the first year or so, J.D., I'm telling you, it was killing me. It was killing me to have to stay back. But the more I've done it – I think the better my game has become in terms of I can still serve volley, I can still chip and charge, but now there are days when I go out there when, you know what, I got to grind. You know, either, either my serve's not big enough, the first volley's not good enough, whatever, and the guy's just eating it up. And I just go, you know what, not working. I got to grind. Well, now I can grind if I have to, and uh, 10 years ago I couldn't. So uh, what else? So now what, so now it doesn't um... – I know. I'd, again, I'd say for me, you know, it's all, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's fairly simple. Some of these things, I think it's kind of that one where it's um, learn to grind and learn to play long, long rallies again and again and realize, Oh, this isn't just a, a one-off option. I'm going to do this. Uh, I'm going to do this for uh, the next four games. This is what I'm going to do now. This is, this is where I'm living. Okay. Now, like, I've like, got one for you. I got one for you. Tactically uh -huh. wise, learn to play more drop volleys okay because i think you become predictable volleys i think you become predictable with your with your with your first volley and your first and, and i'm not gonna even say first volley I'll, I'll i'll say and half volleys because you do such a great job of coming in i mean you 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 come in and and, and if the ball's up you can you can consistently make that first volley you can mm -hmm. consistently make your first half volley. But I'm telling you, when I play you, I feel like I can return and cheat a little bit in terms of not worrying about a drop volley. So I love it. So I, I need, it. so I can cheat and kind of stay back behind, you know, either on or maybe a little bit behind the baseline, knowing that you're going to, you know, and look, you can, you can certainly sting a volley or have volley and play a winner. That's fine. But I think that you want to force your guy to have to play more up and back, or at least have the threat that that dropper is about to come in. That's a great play. I like that one. So, um, what's uh, what do you do? What do you what, what's your what's your uh, my what? first one is to go back to working more chip and charge um, on his second serve, return of serve. So, so you, this is you, this is you sounds, haven't been doing that as well. As I, I've much. not. I just haven't been doing it. I just have. I've been get. I gotten a little lazy, right? So. Uh, I've got a little lazy with just kind of floating the return back and just going, let's go. And I need to start, I need to start getting back to what I used to do a lot, which was to take that second serve, serve it, you know, assuming that it wasn't, you know, a nasty high kicker, but being able to take it and I could, I could slide it. I could bump it. I could flatten it. You know, I don't need to top it. Don't want to top it because the topping thing just makes the ball sit up over there. So I would, I would chip it or, or, or drive it flat. But I was more concerned about getting in and assuming that the server was going to be able to make, 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 make a play on it and then just challenge him to pass. You know, and that's a play that chip charge, I think, because it involves a, a, a certain degree of timing because we're, you know, we're taking a serve, even though it's inside the service line. I think that's a play. It needs to be done frequently 
and sometimes early. It's not something you trot out at four all in the third set. You have to, I think, I think from what I've seen. Well, no, yeah, I mean, totally. You've, you've, you've got to be doing a steady diet of this because one of, the, one of the things I noticed, and I just was thinking about it right now as you mentioned that, is that when I showed, when I, when, when I would show, especially early in the match, uh, an early tip charge on, on, on a, a few second serves, and if I only won half of those points, what I would start getting would be some double faults. Sure. Because the server was going, man, I, I don't want to have to deal with a second serve. So they're bombing the first serve, missing. And then they're, and then they're just going, well, I got to hit a really good second serve. And it's not happening. Well, these are waterboard, these are waterboard you know, techniques of, of applying pressure, uh, not fanatically, but slowly. And they, they accumulate. You know, it's like these little, these little raindrops that just, next thing you know, your lawn is soaked. And we need to, and I, but I think from a, from a standpoint of, of doing them both as a, as a tactic and strategy and even the technical stuff it takes to pull it off, you need to, you need to get everyone in the game early. You need to run that play to feel comfortable running yeah, it. So then when you, right. Cause you can't suddenly, it's, it's not easy to take a server. I mean, you got to admire someone who's gone the whole match without taking a return and coming in on it. And then suddenly way deep into the key stage of the match, they do it. That's yeah. You know, I mean, as Jeff talks a lot about, uh, about our goal ball hunting, you don't want to pull out that one tool that you're looking for in your box. Oh, I see. Yeah, buried deep in the corner of my of my stroke two box is that chip and charge. Hey, man, now it's two all in the third. Let's try it now. It's the same no. reason why I sometimes like to in doubles run the um, run an eye formation early just to see what might happen. Sure. Even if it's forty love. Sure. sure. Well, anyway. listen, that could be. Listen, guys. I mean, that could be something about in your doubles. If you're if you're thinking about not so much what things don't work as well as you want, but maybe some things that you ought to be working on that really could improve your doubles play, that's a great one right there, is to start thinking about, let's, let's start getting really comfortable with, with, with the eye formation. So I'll tell, you, I'll tell you the next one for me is, I need to drive my doubles return to serve more. So, uh, and I, it's, it drive my backhand, my dubs rod. <laughs> Uh, my dubs back in my, yeah, my backhand return to serve more. So again, it's kind of like a little lazy deal. I've gotten into just trying to, you know, I get it and I'm playing, I'm playing the ad side most of the time. Someone serves me out wide and I'm just kind of sliding it back a little slice. And too often what's happening is it takes too much time for it to get over there. The service partner has got a chance to pick it off. But for whatever reason, and maybe this I should be doing this, I should go back to first screen and put this on my stroke technique thing. I don't get the shoulder. It doesn't seem like I get my right shoulder turned far enough to where I could naturally get a better angle back towards that, that, that server's alley. Not in the alley, but back towards that corner there, which is that magic corner, the single sideline and the service line over there cross court. And for me, it ends up being kind of a side-to-side -side swing. And you know what happens is it just kind of, it hangs in the middle. And yet, when I, when I drive my backhand return to serve, it's not a big heavy topper, but it's a kind of a semi-top uh, drive cross court. It does a couple things. First of all, I take it earlier so that server's partner doesn't have time, doesn't have time to be able to sort of poach on it. And even if it ends up in the middle, it's kind of by him. And I just end up hitting kind of a cleaner ball, a little bit more consistent. So it just takes maybe a little bit more work. But for me, tactically, that's I've, I've, I've got to return serve more with, more with this. The next thing for me, J.D., is um, in my singles um, against the better players. And I'm not disrespecting the guys that I play that, that I think I should beat. But I got to do a better job of um, – I got to build a plan before I go out there. And, and for me, um, it's tactically, what, what plan do I want to bring against this guy today? And it could be, obviously it's going to be different. Um, it might be different against different types of players, but I think that, you know, it, it used to be said, well, you got to, you, you know, you got to come out with your, you got to come out with your with your A game every time, and sometimes that's true. But I know from experience when I bring out my A game against certain guys, it has not worked. 
it has. Well, happened. I think it's a question of how we create these and a and a and a and a one and a two. I think, for example, so when I'm here with you, what's what's interesting, having played you for more than twenty years, is like when I first was playing you, you used to you sometimes play the deuce chord in doubles. You used to drive that back and return frequently. That's right. You're driving, and and I think and that and and I see you know now you have you have both, and the slice is pretty nasty too. And uh, I think what you're kind of doing is re reassembling you know it's like for a long time you were a, a constant net rusher drive and go after it and, and now you've learned to be this kind of somewhat more whether it's patient or versatile and and with the return i think for example if you drive it now you have both and also we see particularly in doubles where people are rushing that all the time hmm which which returns that they feel better than others like for example i know like you know when we play that i actually like good go ahead drive it i like that more than i like the slower one yeah yeah. yeah, for well, me, other opponents, other other opponents of who you play, they they the one that dips, they're they're more compromised, and and it also has to do with the way you get a piece of their serve and and how you get yourself in play. So I think, and I think this planning part of it is too. It's like you're just looking to see, okay, what are my what's my broad range of tools, and how am I going to match them against this guy? Yeah, yeah, no, it's true. But I, I guess I'm I'm taking it from. From the point of view, of I've got a known opponent that I've played before and I've lost to this guy three or four times, right? And mm -hmm. rather than thinking, and this is where I guess I came up with this, with, with, with this thing, with build a plan before I play, and I should, I should you know, condition it upon, I've played this guy three or four times, I've never beaten him, or I, maybe I've beaten him once out of four times. And if the plan is to bring your A game and expect that you're going to do it at that level for the entire match when that hasn't worked before you're kidding yourself so to try something different and i've got you know i mean i've got a month ago played the semis right in irvine uh in the hard courts in the singles played a guy number one seed i've never beaten this guy before i was zero and four and i just said look i gotta try something different and so what i tried different was something that i normally don't do and that is what I got. And that's my next thing here, which is to, in singles, is singles is to play more rally balls. Um, that was the door opener with this guy. Right up the middle. And, well, this was, this was the invitation. So when I used to play him, I'd play him out to the corners, thinking, I got to get him out. I got to get him you know, away from the middle of the court. And when I got him out in the corners, I didn't hit my shots well enough because it's such a tight little target out there that it's tough. It's tough to be consistent. So I just said, well, that hasn't worked. Let's try just playing everything right up the middle. And, and right up the middle eventually worked because he kept his same mindset, which was big first or big serve, big forehand. And his geometry changed from the middle, and he contributed mightily in missing shots um, that ended up having me win more points, more game sets, and, and eventually the match. So I'm not saying this is right for every opponent, but I am saying that, that for me, I got to build a plan against the guys where I know that I've not had success in the past. And look, well, if, the you're first, if you're 0 4, if you're 0 4, it's time to. Yeah, change it if it's if you're one in three, maybe you think okay, what uh, what worked at one time, or was that a fluke, or was I doing something strange? And it's yeah, it's always interesting to figure out what those things are. And sometimes though, sometimes these plans you come out with these plans, and then they kind of emerge as the match unfolds. You know, it's kind of a it's not a start to finish plan. It's a notion of some things you're gonna you're gonna attempt and you're gonna. Well, see look, I mean, if you've if you've never played this guy before and you have no you've done no recon on the guy, right? You haven't talked to anyone. You don't know who you're playing, so you go out there and that for me is all right. Well, maybe in the warm up I'll get a little a little information, maybe, but if I can't, if all things is just like I don't know the guy, I don't know anything about him, I can't get anything figured out in the warm up. I'm bringing out my A game. I've got to we'll, open up my evidence. And yeah. we'll just kind of take it from there. So listen, guys, let's, let's, let's move on to the, next, uh, to the next category. But before we do that, I want to make sure that you're, that you're writing these things down on your worksheet. If you don't have the worksheet that you're doing on a piece of paper. And, and listing as many things. I mean, look, Joel's got three. I've got four. You might have 17. It doesn't matter. Um, and it doesn't matter that they're, they're, they're totally different than ours. But 
you're going to see when we get through this exercise here why I want you to write down as many things as you can possibly think of uh, for, for each category. JD, mental. Well, you know, you pointed out something to me, Brent, which I hadn't been, you pointed out to this before. You know, when I uh, want to win points, I'm fairly buoyant and positive. And when I lose points, I think I'm trying to slow things down. But you pointed out, no, every time I lose points, a lot of times I lose points, I get kind of a little negative and sulky in my body language, like down. And so I think the upside is, um, you know, positive regardless of point outcome. You know, good body language throughout. And if it is meant to slow things down, then that becomes an intentional strategy throughout, not just a, a, a losing default. That's right. Positive walk, no matter. That's, that's fine. Um, let's see. That's because I think thing. that, I mean, it's, I, I think for you, it's, it's body language. I mean, yeah. we can have, we can have, we, we can be forcing the same thought in there, right? F, after we win or lose a point. But if, if it looks, I mean, if we're walking a different speed, if we're holding our head a different way, that is, that is trumping, right? That is, that is telling your brain, Hey man, stop fooling yourself, right? Your, your body language is really, is really the ace of spades here. So, and the, and that was what I was referring to the other day when we played right. is that, look, there's just a distinctive difference in walking speed mm -hmm. and you change that. And I think what it does is it helps you clean the slate and start the next point with a clean slate rather than carrying anything, any emotions over the next point. But the other thing it does too, we talked about this earlier when we were doing our test webinar, is that that's, and this is something, look, I'm, I'm not the poster boy for, for being the greatest, you know, mental, mental toughness guy of all time, but I am getting better. One of the things that I've learned is that when I, when I do what, what we're talking about here, if I just chunk the easiest, the easiest fattest sitter of all time, if I can, if I cannot go off off the, the, the deep end and really sort of ask myself the question, well, what I meant to do instead. And if, if I ask myself that question, then if it's a stroke technique, I, I, can, I can dry rehearse it before the next point starts. Or if it's a target choice, you know what, I, made, I just made the wrong choice in the target. I can tell myself, well, what I'm gonna do next time or what I meant to do instead was to, was to do this. And for me, JD, what happens is I learn. Mm -hmm. I learned because I used to go through my, my emotions were up and down. It was just like crazy. I didn't learn anything. I, I just didn't learn. And I think a lot of times we think in our matches that count, whether they're tournaments or the league matches, or maybe they're just a, uh, you know, a practice match that we can't learn. We're just out there sort of playing the game and you can learn so much by what's going on. You know, it, it may be subtle. It may be that you've got to do a post match analysis. But if you can do that, win or lose, um, I think that you will remember these things if you, um, if you do. Well, that physical that. manifestation you pointed out was really interesting because to me, I, I, I don't, I learn, I don't know, I'm, I'm really good at the taking away the learning part. That's like my, that's almost like the easiest part of the game for me is learn. It doesn't mean it doesn't necessarily translate into results, but it means, but I pay pretty good attention to what goes on in these matches and the motions. But when the emotion part triggers something even for five, 10 seconds in between points, that can be less productive. Which, what else? Which, what which else relates I'm... to the second one. How would we put this? This has to do with compassion and acceptance of doubles partner. I, we all miss in doubles. <laughs> what drives me crazy in doubles is when I play with partners who make bad shot selection choices. Like, and, and I have to, I have to realize I got to let that go too. I've got to let that go too. It's like, I mean, may, whether they did or did, it doesn't matter whether they meant to or not meant to. They certainly didn't mean to have us lose the point. And so I have to kind of like have a kind of like, because uh, I, I get more emotional. I get more emotionally anguished about doubles losses than singles losses. Cause it, cause so what happens, what happens on the rare occasion when you make in doubles the wrong shot choice? The wrong shot choice? Well, we win the point anyway. No. <laughs> I see. So no. you unintentionally win it anyway. But no, I mean, what happens? I, nothing. My partner doesn't even know because most of my partners don't even know. I don't know if they know I made a wrong shot. God, I don't like, even know how to write this one out here. Partner. So I think, I think um, partner right. empathy. Partner empathy. Okay, that's better. Partner empathy. Yeah, Call it partner. I, partners, you get partner empathy. Just okay. singular partner. Yep. Partner empathy. All right. Yeah. Good. Partner empathy. That's it. And just to kind of like 
just just relax because then what happens i notice when they make if my partner misses shots i get it that happens if they make shot selection things then i start to feel like i have to do i have to preclude that by trying for more things so we don't get in that situation again you know i get and i get tight and all that okay anything else uh let's see here match play situation you need to i think those those are pretty, let's see, match situation. Do you, oh, you know, I think sometimes. Hey, 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 guys, as Joel is thinking of, uh, of his third thing here, type into the chat box maybe the first thing that you've written down about mental. About, I'm just curious what everyone's kind of writing, uh, writing down um, about mental that you would, maybe one of the things on your list doesn't have to be all of them, but just, but just one thing. Uh, go ahead and type that in. All right. So, JD, what else? Oh, um, let's see here. Um, oh, when I have a better partner, when I'm when I'm clearly the less good partner on a team, yeah, I'm feeling um, inhibited about where I should move and how I should move. So I tend, I sometimes will will shrivel a little more than I necessarily than I necessarily should. So because I don't want to, I don't want to miss. So you don't want. So you don't want to screw it up for the better partner. That's right. All right. So so what are you going to work on with that? I think I have to work on like letting that's the, that's the opposite of part of that's yeah, that's uh that's my empathy. It's like play. I don't know. What do you call that? Let myself play. Yeah. It's like, I, there's shots I could go. I can go for that middle ball. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. And what about you? Trust my first fricking serve. What's that mean? Well, what it means is that, um, against certain opponents, I feel like I have to serve bigger than mm. what I really have to do. And when I do that, I end up, in my, my first serve percentage takes a, takes a big hit. And then I have to throw in a, 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 a too steady a diet of second serves, which you know, is not a problem for this, for this opponent. So for me, JD, this is less of a technique thing. This is more about just trust that the serve you've got, the first serve you've got, if you throw it in there, and you know me, I'm going to the body most of the time, and occasionally I'll go out wide, occasionally I'll go down the tee, but if, if, if I don't trust the quality of my first serve that it won't get the job done against this guy, I get myself into trouble. So you just let yourself, if that gets to the thing you, we talked about years ago, um, when you come up against a better player, the feeling that you have to go for more instead of just like, hey, I know how well I can hit the ball. I know my eighty yeah. percent. I know my eighty percent speed that gets the ball in ninety five percent of the time. Right. Let it be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. and I just have to trust that. Look, I mean, I can't. I. I. I can't control the whole thing a hundred percent of the time. I can't say I'm going to hit a serve so well that it's either going to be an ace or that's not coming back, or it's going to be a fat sitter. So I have to. I have to just trust that that my first serve's good enough. And, and look, I'm always working on my serve, right? I'm always going out there. As I said in the, in the first thing, I'm working on getting that toss in front and not being lazy. So, so knowing that I'm putting the time in, when I get into the match, I mentally, I just, I got to trust that this is going to be, this is going to be okay. You know, another thing for me is to, I got to practice uh, my, my between points. Routine. Oh, your rituals? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because I don't, because I don't practice enough, and it's actually, um, it's a four-parter, a uh, four-part uh, routine. And it's not like, even though I've been doing this for God for decades, it's if if I get lazy and I don't practice this between points routine, when I get into the match, man, it just doesn't feel authentic, doesn't feel natural. It's well, not, it's not like, you haven't practiced it. I haven't practiced it. So it's not like a light switch I can flip on and off. And I think too often, I think everyone would agree, well, geez, I mean, in, in the stroke technique and patterns and this stuff, yeah, I got to practice that forever. But the mental thing, shouldn't I have, uh, shouldn't I just kind of know about it and have it all figured out and that's it? Well, no, no, for me, I got to, I got to practice that thing all the time. And then I guess I've got um, one more thing and that is to, be more decisive um, with my first volley. Well, wait, is that a, is that a match play situation? Or is that more of a tactical? What, what, I mean, it's a trusting. Okay. It's a trusting. So, All right. 
for but is that me, meant to I be mean, mentally tougher? Is that to be mentally tougher? Does that get to the trust? For me, it is. So for, it's related to the serve. For me, it's like I serve out wide to you in the deuce court, and you return it and float it back. And I just want to go. I just want to get it over there cross court rather than really going over there and giving a little stick. I mean, look, it's not a technical problem. I've got the volley. Right. You know, we do this in practice. I can hit a, a gazillion of them. So it's, so it's not that. It's just it's the trust thing that I can actually stick it and make it. I'm not trying to hit a winner, but I want to I be more forcing than the last couple of years. I've just kind of gone over there and just kind of played it so safely this is the truth. cross court. I hear the same things about the first volley, the first serve, and the overhead. Maybe you're playing a little bit more for possession than, than you know, maybe you're happy to get. Uh, yeah, but see, with the overhead, I don't really feel like I've got, I've got the, the power technique. I don't think I'm really setting up on that right. Okay, Whereas so the man. volley, the volley to me is like, you know, I mean, I can, you're very I, volley. I, 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 I can do this thing all day long in my sleep. That's, right. that's not a problem. But what I can't do in my sleep is get the feeling of trusting that I can stick it. So, so guys, listen, I encourage you in this mental thing. And I, look, I, I see that we got a lot of things going on here in the, uh, in the chat box. And uh, that is cool. Um, yeah, trust and go after my serve. <laughs> Shrivel is the right world, world Jay. Joel, can you, can you see these comments? Yeah, I see them right uh, here. Sure. Yeah. Um, do you want me to speak to any of them or do you want to just go on? Uh, no, you... I'm just, I'm just, I just, uh, I'm just glad that. So, so guys, listen, I, I don't want you to hold back on this. Joel's got three. I've got three. Again, you could have 17. It's fine. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to uh, come back to it. All right. So Joel, physical. Oh, for me, it's physical. Uh, what it's is, a, what do you, what do you got to do physically that would, that would really help your singles or really help your doubles? My thing is always, um, and it's a good one. You pointed out it's, it's agility. It's being a little more, a little more flexible, a little more willing to, let go a little more limber, a little more dynamic with my body movements. You know, I'm very, uh, I'm, um, you know, I paid a trainer to watch me play tennis, a trainer at a club, but she watched me play and pretty good at the balance part, at the methodical, getting in there. I know where it's going, but, but she said, you know, you could probably reach a little bit more than you think you could if you let yourself. So that's stuff that I need to do more and get and be more agile and different, be more flexible. Look, and look, we know, uh, like I'm 59 and we know our, our bodies are not going to automatically cooperate for force. So I have to do more of those kind of things that get agility and a little more explosive and a little more dynamic. I'd say that's it. I think that's the most important thing is right. agility. Okay. Anything else besides agility? Physically? I, would say, I would say it's um, what agility is, is flexibility. The same thing is, is uh, well, dynamic no, it's, flexibility. Yeah, it's more, it's more strength. It's more flexible strength. Sure. Sure. And then I would say dynamic. It's just like, for example, I think as much as, much as I like to come to net, you know, just I, I like coming to net. I'm not bad at that area, but I think I could be yet better at doing that stuff and, and not be trapped in certain situations and, and be a little more, uh, yeah, those things. Agility, flexibility, dynamic. And, and you? Good. Uh, you know, the thing for me is I do, you know, I, I do, a, I, I play a lot. Um, like today I did not play, but I went, I rode the mountain bike for about an hour and 10 hour and 15 minutes out here behind our, our house in Moraga up in the Hills, Oakland Hills through Canyon and up to Redwood park. And it's a, it's a, it's a lung buster. Um, you know, going up Pinehurst, <laughs> it is steep, but it's, it's, it's beautiful. I mean, I, I love riding the mountain bike. I, I don't have a road bike, but if I did, I would ride that as well. I, I think, I think bike riding is great for tennis. I don't do any long distance running. You know, I do some, I do a lot of sprinting and I do some gym work as well, but I've got to continue to stretch more. And stretch. that's it. You mean, wow, you do, you do riding bikes. You do, you lift weights. You do, I think stretching. God, I got a foam roll. I'll, I'll give you, I have, I have an extra foam roller. I'll give it to you. Well, I don't have to do a lot, but I just have to be more disciplined with it in terms of doing it um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And I got the foam roller and I've got some great stretching things that when I'm disciplined to do them, it's not like I don't know how to stretch. I do have a good stretching routine. I get lazy sometimes and don't, and don't do it. And so I just need to make sure that um, I'm, I'm shoving it in there, even if I don't want to do it. And come on, don't want to do it. It's 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes, big deal. When I stretch a ton, my game 
uh, my game is better. You know, another thing I want to I want to do more of is is plyometrics and plyomet plyo ply help help me out here metrics guys. plyometrics. So plyometrics is you know not. Is, is I guess in a sort of a, a dumb and down uh, definition is is really is more jumping and more to where you're getting explosive for your first step, right? So we all know that the first you know the first step in tennis is crucial to being decisive and getting a setup into the hitting uh, the hitting setup position as soon as possible. So if you need to, you can go ahead and. Uh, and make some minor adjustments. And so plyometrics are like, you know, you've seen the boxes in the gym, the jump boxes, some are real short, some are a little bit higher. But those types of things where you really start to work on on building that explosive first step. Does that make sense? Total sense. You know, I, I took uh, Pilates classes and lessons for a while, and the instructor said at one point, she says, I'm going to help you get to the balls you can't get. I said, you don't have to do that. It's a three-yard game. You help me do better with the ones I can get. Because we all know, we all, I never lost a match because I couldn't run down a lot of balls. I lose matches because here it is, right in front of you. There it is, three yards. I mean, if, if you're playing someone and you can't run down ball after ball after ball, then call me up. I'll write about them. I mean, mostly. Well, look, I mean, no. I mean, some guys can, can do that for a set and a half, J.D. Well, they're but pretty then, good. But, but, you know, but then, then, then the endurance thing goes in the tank because – there's been there's not been enough training there's not been enough physical work to be able to get the combination the combination of agility and a first step and flexibility and as you said dynamic and endurance I mean, endurance a, is it's obviously a three, yard game. A, three yeah. yards all these balls right here for us and how do we how do we maximize it reminds me of the thing tell me your Jody Rush story about Jody Rush and his dad didn't he what he said to when he was young is, if you never miss a shot you're supposed to make, you'll well, be fine. Oh, no, yeah. I mean, Jody Rush's dad said that, and Jody Rush, by the way, if you guys who don't know him from the Pacific Northwest, uh, a senior tennis legend, another nasty lefty, by the way, um, he told me a story once at lunch at a tournament. He said, um, he, he, he said his dad told him once, he said, son, if you never miss the easy ball, don't have to hit a winner, but if you never miss the easy ball, you'll be a national champion. And, and that's true, but, but, but easy means can you create easy, quote unquote, easy balls for two and a half hours, right? right. I mean, since this, it, and, and, and I think it's, it's more of a three-step game. I think if I'm going to, you know, I've already encouraged you to start working on the drop three, volley. I said, I said it's a three-yard game. A uh, three-yard game, nine feet. I still think if you start working the drop volley, like we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. I got to run more than nine feet for that. That's true. So, and isn't that what, I mean, we're getting a little off topic here, but to me, I sort of refined my definition of what an all court being able to deploy an all court game is. <clears throat> I used to think it was, well, can I visit all parts of the court? And really, yeah, that's part of it. But the other part is, can you force your opponent to visit all parts that's of fantastic. the court? That's right. Can you put your mm. opponent in all those parts on your terms, not their terms? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I put them in the front part of the court when I hit short, when my foreign goes short. There you go. I just didn't want to. Right. <laughs> right. But the point uh, is, yeah, I'll that's tell you, great. I'll tell you the other thing I, I, I want to work more on is my balance, right? And so simple balance exercises, which would be, I mean, what's the most fundamental balance exercise we can do? Right? Stand on one of those beams. <laughs> well, no, I mean, you can stand on one leg. Mm-hmm. I mean, stand on one leg and then you, you know, a lot of people, I mean, I can't, I can't do it for any, any sustained amount of time, but stand on one leg, do it on the other leg, then start to do it to where you start to bend that knee and on, on one leg, get in the BOSU ball. Um, we had a Jeff and I go ball hunting just a few days ago. We had a, one of our students wanted to know how to get a good, good player, but he wanted to get better at, at fitness. And so Jeff suggested one of the things was, was balance on, on the BOSU ball. Uh, in, in, incredible exercise, but these are all things that we can do, but I just haven't done enough of them. So, so those are kind of the three things right now for me, guys, I want you to be writing down physical. What, what things, if you're not doing my plan, you know, if you're not, if you're not 
doing the, the off-court training that I'm doing, which is working on speed, which is working on agility, which is working on endurance, um, then I suggest you do so. And I suggest that you write down, you know, on the list. I've got three. Joel's got three. You can make your list 17. So, guys, let's do this. Let's go, Joel. Let's go back to question number one. And I want everyone to go back to whatever they wrote down there for question number one. Um, JD, out of the two things that you wrote down here, what's, what's your number one thing that if, if I put a gun to your head, I said you, you can only the, choose the, one? The first one. This one here? Yes, sir. So high balls down the middle. Okay. Guys, I want you to circle on your list what's, what's your number one thing. Uh, it's probably going to be the number one thing. <laughs> and I don't want it to be this. I don't want us to be doing this uh, because there may be something else. I don't want you guys to be influenced by us um, choosing our number one thing because it might be something different from you. I got to get my chat box out of here. Hold on for a sec. There we go. Okay. Um, all right. So guys, circle that number one thing on question one. Um, JD. Um, question the, number two. Oh, the first one, the grind. Absolutely. Learn, learn, learn to grind. Okay. Yep. All right. Um, and if I look at mine, um, <laughs> I'm going to go with this. All right. I got to, I got to be more committed when I'm stuck and I say stuck because right, I'm trying to get in. But when I'm stuck back in the baseline, I got to stop thinking that a deep ball that's coming in that I can't realistically approach on, where I might go to a corner on an approach shot, why would I do it on a groundy? It doesn't, it doesn't do anything for me. Why so not just go back middle deep? Go back middle deep, force the guy to have footwork to get out of the way of the ball, which we all know is way tougher than, than trying to move over to the corner to get to a ball. All right, so let's go on to number Three guys, and I'm assuming you did that on, on question number two. You circled that one thing on your list. JD, for you. I'm going to go here with the partner empathy. I'm going to go here with the second one. Okay. That's more. That's more. Um. Meant. That's more in my head. That's gonna. Yeah. Um. That's gonna. Phew. Dog me more. Phew! I can feel like we can play doubles together now. Are you kidding? Uh, You're the better partner. I always get worried that I'm going to let you down. <laughs> oh, that, would, that would be number. That would be number three. All right. Um. For me. God, this is it right here, man. I want to be more decisive with that first volley. I want to just go out and practice it and just start sticking it. If I, if I lose the point because I miss it wide or I miss it deep, I'd rather do that than miss it because I just play it over there and the guy goes over there and thank, thank you very much for the passing shot. Um, so, guys, on your worksheet, circle that one thing that you've got on your list under, under mental. And then, J.D., what about, what about number four? I'll go with agility. Agility. Smart. Yeah. Okay. Uh, guys, circle that one thing for number four. I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with this because the stretch more is just lazy. I can do that. But I think if I really want to get a bang for my buck in terms of what's on this list, that the plyometrics for my first step um, are, are the thing. So let's do this. Joel, what did, you, what did you put down now for technique? You said? High forehand. High forehand. Okay. What did you put down for uh, tactics? Grind. 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 Baby. Let me come on. Here we go. Grind. What did you put down for mental? Uh, partner empathy. Partner empathy. And what did you put down for physical? Agility. Agility. Okay. Okay. And uh, let's see. For technique, I don't remember what I put down. Help me out. What did I put down for technique? I Wait, put, oh. I uh, put the rally down, ball? The I rally, put ball. Down forehand forehand, rally ball. I, I put down forehand rally ball. Yeah. Right. Okay. And for tactics? Wait, what do you have? I oh. put down uh, number two. I put down singles. Rally middle. Yeah. Uh, singles. Rally middle. 
rally middle. Okay. On mental, I put down stick the first volley. Not as a winner, but just give it a little bit more of a ride. And physical, I put on, I think it was uh, plyometrics. plyometrics. So, guys, I think that uh, on your worksheet, you've got the same thing for be question number five that you're writing down each one of your number ones from each one of those categories. JD? Yes. What's the number one thing? Now, here we go. This is where, this is where we really got to think. What's the number one thing that you think that if, if you work in the next 30 days like a dog on this number one thing, that the other three things that you've listed could become irrelevant? If I could hit high forehands better, I'd, I'd practice them. I could get, I'd have to be more agile and that would allow me to grind. I still so would never saying, forgive my. So, so you're so you're saying that you don't need to develop agility first to be able to hit this high forehand. Well, it's one of those fun philosophical questions. Do you get fit to play tennis, or do you play tennis to get fit, and which becomes which? I mean, I don't know. I don't know if how much gym time that might help me get agile would necessarily then play out in the forehand. It's like if you said to me, "Okay, you have you have 60 minutes next week to practice either high forehands or agility." I'd say, I, let me practice high forehands. And okay. then it would allow me to grind more because that would definitely allow me to grind more because then I could feel, all right, I can stay in these rallies. Okay. Um, and I, but but I, nothing is going to help me forgive my partner. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> no. God, no. you're no fun. No, I'm okay. I just have it in my head. I don't, I, I'd say positive. You know what? Maybe if you worked in the high forehand, you'd naturally get more empathy for your partner. That could be because I'd realize that I'm a, a limited human being. And, and besides for you, you don't make bad shots. I don't. I've never seen you make a bad shot selection in doubles. Not a shot yeah. selection. Everybody misses, yeah. but you don't make bad choices. I in fact, if anything, I yeah, guess you, we haven't played enough doubles. What you played, you, Jesus. Okay, so for me, um, for me, it's this right here. That mental, the stick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 mental. So you just got to become Captain uh, Crunch on that first volley. So that's it. Yeah. So guys, I want you to do the same thing. I want you to go through this exercise. I'm assuming that you have and circle the one thing out of the four categories that if you spent the next 30, 60, maybe 90 days just working on it, that the other three things might, might become irrelevant. I don't know if they would totally become irrelevant, but, but they would, there'd be such a huge payoff, right? So so uh, now that you guys have identified that one thing, right? And that was the whole topic of trying to help you figure out what's the one thing in your game right near, right near, right now. Uh, here's what I want you to do. All right. If it was technique, then the first thing you have to know is what's the least amount of technique you actually need for that stroke, right? If you think that you need to add more technique to what you're doing. So for example, if you got a forehand, if your thing is a forehand rally, uh, a forehand rally ball and you're going, well, I need to add another layer of, I need to get more grippy. I need to get more windshield wipery. I need to do whatever. I'm going to encourage you to do the, do the opposite rather than adding something. I'm going to ask you to take something away. So Joel, I think your thing was technique, wasn't it? Correct, sir. So, um, what what could you take away? What, what let's see. What was your what was your thing? Your thing the was high forehand. the forehand. The high. So, what could you take away technique wise that might make that better? Let me think about that. I think I need to not worry about the hand part of it. I think I think I get confused between the stroke part and the movement part, and I need to put. Better, don't worry about the stroke part and think more about the body movement part. Like, like you said, that thing about, you know, where you get, make someone have footwork and how do they get away from the ball and just, just right. think about spacing. And if I get the spacing, let the stroke be the stroke. I yeah. know I had it forehand, so it's just a forehand from a different contact point. And I, and I, would, also, you know, I would also have you think about a different, a different tactic, which would be a mindset. And that tactic yes. would be, well, look, I got a high forehand. This is kind of a good ball to just roll it up there pretty high. Exactly. And start getting comfortable with that, adding that shot to your game as a staple, because 
I know for me over the last 10 years, wow. I mean, I've gotten better at that shot and, and I sort of welcome the high forehand now because it gives me an opportunity to really roll a ball up there and it becomes a strategy. I mean, it, it, it becomes a play in terms of if I'm not too far back, if I'm sort of on my, on my baseline and I get a high forehand that's sitting there, I'm rolling that thing up high and I'm probably coming in. So the other thing to do with the kid in mind then is to think, okay, even on low balls to the forehand, practice the high forehand. You know, practice, like you're talking about, okay, if it comes high to my forehand, roll it high back and deep and feel comfortable doing that. That's so right. I feel comfortable rolling it high and back off a, off a waist high one too. Just you could. To, it's just, it, just technically it's a little bit tougher. But a just little bit to tougher. Gauge, just to engage the technique. That's just right. In, just to, you know, just to try it. Right. So I guess that to get back to what's the least amount of technique you actually need. So if you change your mindset on how to play that shot and go more into a roller, I think what you'll go is, well, gee, all I have to do that's technically right. to do that is this. And that's based more on what do, you know, what do I have to do to just kind of get that rainbow up there? So tactics, guys, if, you're, if your number one thing is tactics, what I want you to do is recreate that specific match play situation into a drill with a practice partner. So rather than, rather than what, I don't know what else you could possibly do, but you've got to, you've got to, if, if tactics is your thing, is your number one thing, then you've got to figure out what's the specific situation that happens in your matches, whether it's singles or doubles, and then you've got to get someone out there who will be cooperative, right? It might mean that, that, that your practice partner needs to cooperate with feeding you certain balls. Ask them if they'll do that for 10 or 15 minutes, and then, and then you reciprocate and say, well, now what do you want to do for the next 10 or 15 minutes, and you help do that. But you've got to recreate that tactical or strategic situation in your matches into a drill session. And since I don't know what it is that you put down, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to figure that out uh, on your own. So mental, right? And for me, the mental thing was, was the volley, right? Well, the trusting it, even though it's, it's funny. trusting it. Yeah. <laughs> so for me, Joel, what I'm going to do is I'm going to visualize it. Every day I'm going to sit back and I'm going to visualize it. I'm going to sit back, you know, in a quiet spot for two minutes, close my eyes, and I'm going to visualize that situation. I'm serving out wide, and you know what I'm doing? I'm serving out wide to you, and I see you float it back, and I come in, and I just feel, I feel through a visualization how I want to stick that bomb. And then I feel how I want to move over to cover, you know, the potential passing shot. I'm not sticking, I'm not visualizing that I'm hitting winners, but I'm, I'm visualizing I'm really being confident with this volley. And so it could be that with your thing that you are going to sit back and you're going to visualize a situation where I just want a great point. Okay. I've got this nice, even keeled walking pace. Not, I'm not rushing, but I'm not, I'm not preening. I'm not prancing around. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you visualize where you chunk an easy ball. And you, and you end up coming back and doing, and doing the exact same thing. So, guys, you've got to figure that out, too. What is that thing if you put down uh, visualization? Then physical, you know, you just got to commit to whatever plan it is that you need to do. You know, whether it's agility, whether it's endurance, whether it's plyometrics, whatever it is, you've got to start building a habit in terms of what that thing is. And so the fastest way to do this and look, you guys can figure this out on, on your own and, 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 and try to do a, you know, do it yourself type of deal. But the fastest way to really get this done is, is let me help you. And the way that I can best help you is if you and I get on a 15 minute private free one-on-one -on -one coaching call and what I will help you do is kind of zero in. We'll go over your list, those four things. We can actually go over the whole list if you want, but your four things that you came up, your number ones, and then what your eventual number one is that you identified. And uh, it's a free coaching call, 15 minutes. That's plenty of time to go over your one thing. I just want to make sure, and you should too as well, that you've got that one thing nailed. The way to do that is go over to my online calendar scheduler where you can pick a date and time that works perfect for you, just 15 minutes. And the URL is right down below. It's new.webtennis.com forward slash schedule dash call. And if you can't remember it, don't worry. I'll be, shoot, I'll be shooting you out an email here in just a few minutes, thanking you for showing up uh, for the webinar, but I'll also have that thing in there too. 
I don't know. My schedule is pretty full already, so uh, you might want to jump on that right now. But again, it's new.webtennis.com forward slash schedule dash call. So guys, if you've got any questions, uh, just go ahead and, and type them into the chat area right now. I'm going to stay on for a while and answer any of your questions that you've got. Uh, JD, thanks, man. I really, really okay. appreciate sure. spending time with us today. Um, people can find you over Twitter. Is that right? Yeah. Joel Trucker. Yeah. At Twitter. Yep. Yep. Cool, man. Cool. Um, okay. Cool. Very good. Well, listen, guys, like I said, I'm going to stay on uh, into the chat. If you've got any questions, let me know. And uh, if nothing else, you don't have a question. I would love to just read in the chat area. If this helped you at all, kind of zero in, if this exercise that Joel and I uh, led you through today, did this help you at all? Kind of think about what maybe would be the one thing that if you really worked on it for 30, 60, 90 days, what that one thing is, that it really might be the thing that kind of made everything, not, you know, I hate to say irrelevant, but it could really minimize your kind of laundry list of things that you guys want to, uh, um, you know, that you guys want to work on. And it might even inspire you. I wonder if this inspired you all to do it, to get out there and, uh, and kind of work on something. So Nona, thanks, man. I always love having you on. Um, one of my very early subscribers, Nona from Seattle. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Thayer, very good, man. Thank you for hanging out today. Got, I'm glad you got some good ideas. Uh, Mark, your summary, forgot the backhand technique, big changes, practice hitting backhand, the neutral place that I want to hit to keep it simple. That, that is the phrase right there, is to keep it simple. Guys, um, if you want to jump on a free private coaching call with me, just one-on-one, -on -one, uh, it is free, uh, but I need you to schedule it and just go over to new.webtennis.com forward slash schedule dash call, and, um, and you can cherry pick a date and time that works best for you, and uh, we'll get on that call and really make sure that what you're zeroing in on is um is really the best thing for you um i'm going to stay on again any more questions let me know type it into the chat box a really uh question from brian over 70 playing 20 plus year olds and doubles competition best tactics oh man brian you are um you're the man um listen you know when you're playing young guns um they typically want to stay back. And I'm assuming when you say that, you know, 20 year olds and doubles, they're probably staying back and trying to wail on the ground strokes where I've had the best success for me is actually to come in and to just think, look, all I got to do is I just got to make two volleys or I got to make three volleys. And usually what happens is for them, the tension ratchets up. They expect it off their big first groundy boom. Oh, that's coming back. Oh, here comes the second one and they get bigger and bigger and they eventually miss. The other thing too, is that if they do want to stay back and you get a ball where you can control a drop shot or you get a ball where you can control a slice that skids and stays low, maybe goes to a semi to a full Western forehand for that young 20 year old gun over there, that's gonna be your problem. Same thing with a two-handed backhand. Same thing with a, with a, uh, with a two-handed backhand. So, um, other than that, I mean, it's just, it's a great way to kind of minimize stroke technique, practice against 20 year olds that have got a lot of pace. And um, I love it. I mean, I just, I, I think that's great. Um, who else we got here? Suzanne uh, fired up. I love it. Um, yeah. You know, you want to play, you got to rest your arm, but you got to be smart. You know what, Suzanne, let's do this. Um, let's get on that, co on, on, on that coaching call because I want to find out more about what's going on with the arm. I've got some, I got a recommendation for you that would help you if it's an elbow uh, or wrist or maybe it's a muscle thing. Um, go over to new.webtennis.com forward slash schedule dash call and let's jump on a quick little 15 minute call and I got some ideas for you. Uh, you're also saying to lean to learn uh, better to visualize and do things to improve while giving the arm a break. Absolutely. I mean, anytime we're injured, this is not a time to feel sorry for yourself. This is actually an opportunity. Let your body heal, get that injury fixed, and be able to start visualizing the things that we talked about. You know, you could visualize each one of the four. And I'm watching, I'm watching Mr. Curios. I guess it's live. He's just busted a racket. Oh my God. And then the, anyway, so, I, um, but, uh, at, absolutely. Visualizing is really, 
really undercoached and uh, and underutilized. And I've been doing it for you know several years, and it really helps me. Uh, Joe, um, you're welcome. And that's great. I'm I'm, I'm glad that you kind of we kind of fleshed some things out that you can start to work on. Uh, Brian, you're welcome. Uh, Suzanne, you're welcome as well. Guys, I'm going to stay on for a couple more minutes if you want me to. And uh, we got Jeff Salzenstein calling in right now. Well, Jeff, you're going to have to wait. I'm doing something more important. No, I didn't say that. Um, so, guys, I'll stay on for a few more minutes. And uh, Mark, you got to go. Coaching group to deal with. Had a boy. Go get him. Um, Hope you guys enjoyed today's webinar. A lot of fun for me. It was actually kind of a test, trying to see what um, what this might be like. And uh, again, I'm just curious if this was uh, helpful for you. And if you got a question, and certainly if you want to jump on a private 15 minute coaching call, it is free. Just go over to new.webtennis.com forward slash schedule a call or schedule dash call. And uh, uh, Mark, that's cool, man. Ten years, that's great. Okay, guys. Well, listen, I'm going to sign off. If you have any more questions, you can hit me up uh, at my email address, which is brent at webtennis.com. And uh, Craig, do I teach individual lessons? Um, you know what? Let's get on a call. And I think I might have something better for you. Let's get in a call. Just go over to new.webtennis.com forward slash schedule dash call and let's chat. Um, I might have something for you. Uh, Kenny, you're welcome, man. Always good to have you um, on, on whatever I'm doing and, and buying my courses and, and just kind of hanging out. You're a great guy. And, uh, and Sam, Sandra would love for a doubles only webinar for sure. Uh, Sandra, if I was to ask you, what's the number one thing that you want to work on in doubles, what would it be? Go ahead and type that into the chat box and let me know. Uh, what, what, what would be something for doubles that, uh, right now that you would love, love to work on? And you know, if you want to do that in the call, we can do that in the call. Uh, doubles only webinar on core positioning. Yeah. I mean, that's just so important, so important. And, uh, that's a great thing. You know, we can do, we, we can do my, my court diagram, kind of an X's and O's kind of a chalkboard type thing, which can really diagram a lot of plays and show you court positioning, shot choice and court positioning, which is what's the right shot. Right. So, um, cool. We'll do that. All right, guys, I am out again. If you want to get in touch with me, just hit me up over at Brent at web Thank you so much for Hanging out with me today. I am recording this and I will send you the link to the recording either this evening or tomorrow. All right, guys, over and I think it's over and out. See ya.